Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where we talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. I just got back from Chicago this morning where I was interviewing president and CEO of the San Francisco Federal Reserve, Mary Daly. It was a wonderful interview. We talked about monetary policy, we talked about the labor market, we talked about the housing crisis. The whole goal I had in mind with the interview was to talk about all of those things that oftentimes I don't think get the press that they need to when we talk about the economy it can oftentimes feel like treasure yields are the only thing that matters but really it's like okay but people can't afford a home so how does that all factor in so we talk about that in this interview and there's a lot of questions that i wanted to ask her that i wasn't able to get to and i'll probably do a separate video talking about some of those but please enjoy the segment of the interview and i'll attach the link where you can go and watch the whole thing as well so I want to begin by first talking about the housing situation. So there was a letter from housing-centric associations, including the NHAB and the National, Associ uh, National Association of Realtors, asking Jerome Powell to stop hiking rates and to not sell off any mortgage-backed securities until the housing market has stabilized. And there's this push-pull that's going on with housing, like supply-demand misbalance. People who want a home can't get one. There aren't enough homes. Uh, how does the Fed balance this housing crisis with policy decisions, especially considering the impact that rate hikes have on mortgage rates? Sure. So it's a really important question and it's complicated, but let me start with what the Fed does. What are, we have two congressionally mandated goals, price stability, full employment, and right now we're achieving the full employment goal and missing on the price stability goal. Now, why is that so important? Well, ultimately, low inflation, this 2% target we have, is a place where people don't have to think about it. They're not making their decisions based on what's going to happen to inflation tomorrow. But when inflation's above 2%, like it is now, and it was, it was even higher before, hitting 7%, we've gotten it down, we've made quite a bit of progress. But when it's high, people are getting up every morning and thinking about inflation, and that's going to affect their decisions. And one important decision it affects is housing. So yes, mortgage interest rates have risen as we're trying to slow the economy to get demand back in line with existing supply. But let's think before we started the interest rate tightening cycle, inflation was rising, housing inflation was really rising. And so individuals might have had a lower mortgage interest rate, but people with mortgages in some cities weren't even competitive in the market because people were coming paying cash and owning two or three homes. And the whole housing market was very much out of balance. And I have the nine Western states in the United States, many of those cities, Boise, Idaho, Salt Lake City, those were the the, where the housing prices in the United States were rising most quickly and first time home buyers were completely priced out of the market. So what the Fed's job is, is to get that price stability back in check, have that be that 2% target, and then the housing market will start to rebalance itself. But you, you mentioned, and it's absolutely important we recognize this as a nation, we have more demand for houses than we have homes ready for occupancy, whether those are rentals or purchase homes. And that's going to cause prices to be elevated and housing markets to be competitive. And what I'm seeing now is many, many discussions across the country about how do we increase the supply. And I was just in Salt Lake City talking to some home builders and they're, they're starting to think about how do we continue to increase supply, just not at the rapid clip we were when you know, interest rates were, were lower and demand was right around the corner. And they're also starting to rethink what types of homes they build. Building homes that fit first time home buyers price points as opposed to maybe, you know, the third or fourth home that you're buying in your life. Yeah. And I think that's all what we have to do. But ultimately the trade off we face is, is one that was given to us by Congress. Our jobs are very simple. Our mandated goals are price stability and full employment. We're achieving full employment and we're missing on price stability and so Congress mandates that we achieve that goal and that's what we're working towards. And it almost feels like there's a new normal that we're facing. Like this is a term that gets thrown out a little bit um, where maybe we're in a world where inflation does remain kind of high um, and historical patterns are not repeated in the way that they always were. And, you know, the Fed has accomplished in, in nine months what normally takes about a year and a half to do. Like it's gone really quickly um, and really I, I suppose, impactfully in, in some sectors of the market. And some would argue that it's not rate hikes doing a lot of the lifting, but supply and demand normalization. Uh, so in what way do you think monetary policy would begin to get in the way of supply and demand normalization? Like, is there something that the Fed is looking at with supply normalizing where it's like, okay, we need to stop hiking rates because it could get in the way of just naturalization? 
way of just naturalization? Sure, that, that's a, a nice question, an excellent question. So the way that I think about unpacking that is that you have overall inflation. And for a moment, let's just go to core inflation, taking out food and energy. I, we recognize, I totally recognize that people pay for food and energy. In fact, those are the high value items that so many people found hard to afford. But ultimately, they're volatile categories and monetary policy doesn't affect them very much. It's more global situations like wars and you know, uh, who wants to produce energy at any given time, global demand. So we just take those two things out and then we're left with what we call core inflation. And I like to break core inflation into three components, goods inflation, housing or shelter inflation, and then core services x housing. It's often called super core, but basically it's all other services absent shelter services. And if you look at those things, then goods price inflation is coming down the most quickly. But that is almost entirely driven. It's driven a little bit by changes in demand because of interest rates, because interest rates affect durable goods purchases, car purchases, um, business investment. But it also really gets brought down by the supply chains normalizing. So as they normalize, goods price inflation comes down, and that's a good thing. That's what I would think of as an easy win on the inflation fight, and not something that the Fed policy is really the biggest contributor to. And that will continue to go um, down and where it will stop and whether it will return to its deflationary pre-pandemic trend is hard to say because there's a lot of things that can keep it a little bit higher. But definitely that's where we've already seen a lot of progress. The next one where we're seeing progress where the Fed does matter, and you mentioned in your first question, is how shelter inflation. So shelter inflation, we started um, raising interest rates early last year. We had signaled we were going to raise them before. Mortgage interest rates went up refinancing went down and housing price growth started to slow. The whole housing market slowed. That is a direct um, result of Fed policy raising interest rates. And that is part of why overall inflation is coming down. And then this third component, services without housing in it, X housing, is the stickiest and it's the hardest to come down. It often lags the other two. And we're just starting to see some improvement in that sector. And I can, we will need to see more improvement to feel like we're really back on a path to 2%. But I don't feel like policy is yet interrupting the return of supply and demand because remember what's driving supply is really the supply chain disruptions from the pandemic. And then another part of supply that is often forgotten are people. And labor supply is one of the biggest components of supply that we have. And what's really nice is that this long and durable expansion we've been in as we get inflation down in particular, you've seen people coming back in. Labor force participation rates are, are rising. And so that's a very strong help to maintaining a healthy economy and also bringing supply and demand back into balance. So we have more work to do. Inflation's still high, but I don't see our policy as interrupting those improvements. I see it as aiding those improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, going to this back to this idea of a new normal where rates remain high, like potentially at five percent for a sustained period of time. Bank of America released a report today talking about you know the five reasons that rates could stay above five percent, including sticky wages, fewer workers, record debt burdens, uh, deglobalization, demographics, and chronic underinvestment from countries. And so I know a lot of people ask you about like the present moment, but when you look out into the world beyond, do you see a world where these things come to fruition and impact how we? interact with the economy into the future. Sure. And I think really that's a that's sort of a time where we have to step back from what's happening today and ask what's the longer run. And for that, if I may, I'll just talk about what we come into the pandemic with. And so prior to the pandemic, the 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 principles we were dealing with is the neutral rate of interest when there are no shocks to the economy, everything's exactly where it should be, was very, very low. Labor force growth was very, very low. GDP growth potential was 2% or lower. And the inflation targets that all countries were facing or setting, we were going to be fighting them from below. Inflation was too low and we're pushing it up. So that's sort of the world we came in with. Then the pandemic hits, inflation comes to most countries, and many countries raise the policy rate, just like the United States is. And now we have interest rates that are pretty high. And now the question is, and one that gets asked a lot, 
is are we going to go back to the pre-pandemic world? Or has this been a reset and now rates are going to be, the neutral rate of interest is going to be higher. Now, 5% is not going to be the new neutral. That I mean, there's no evidence that that will be the new neutral. That's still the policy rate trying to fight back in high inflation. But you absolutely could see the, the nominal neutral rate was 2% inflation plus 0.5 real rate, 2.5. I completely could imagine that we go from 2.5, anywhere between 2.5 and 3 as the nominal neutral in the go forward. But that's 50 basis points, not, you know, two and a half basis point, and 250 basis points, rather. And so I think it's one of the lessons, I guess I'll say, Kyla, that I've taken from doing this job a long time, working as a, an economist and in the Fed, is that every single downturn I've ever been in and every single recovery I've ever been in people have declared that the world has fundamentally changed and nothing will ever be the way it was before. And that has never proven to be true. What I learn each and every time is people come out of the cyclical downturn, they come into an expansion like we're in now, we fight back the inflation, people go ahead with jobs and careers, they buy homes, they have families, they invest in their communities. And yes, shocks come, but we have well-oiled institutions who can deal with them and we we go through it again and yes everything looks a little different but if you step back and look historically things are more similar than different and we can learn lessons that help us go forward so yes we'll probably have new normal things but they're not going to be there's no indication there'll be gigantic resets. I mean, remember last year, everybody said nobody's ever going to work again. Yeah. Millennials are never coming back to work. Yeah. Well, you know, people work. And I see labor force participation rising and everybody's not walking off their jobs quietly quitting. And people are, yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of, a, we call the, whatever we see today as the next thing we'll always see. And I think we want to caution ourselves and be patient to ride this the cyclical wave, get through it, and recognize there's a future that has a lot of stability ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and getting rid of some of that uncertainty for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you said uh, in a recent interview that holding rates steady is policy action, uh, that recent bond market movements could be equivalent to a rate hike, depending, um, and also that markets are adapting to everything. And you know, there's this thin line between, I think you said, disorderly and orderly pricing. Yes. Um, and, and normalization, right? So, but for the Fed, how do you balance managing markets, right, and like dealing with that side of things, and then also telling people, like everyone in this room, right, what they need to hear, especially during these really uncertain times? So I'm going to maybe, I don't know if this is a myth you all hold or not, but I'm going to say how I do things and how I approach my work. And I'm guessing it's going to bust a couple of myths, but maybe not. <laughs> so. I work for the American people. I work for each and every one of you. I get up every morning and do my job because I care about the lives and livelihoods of you and your families and everyone else who lives here in the United States and works here in the United States and has activities here. That's, uh, that's why I'm in a central bank. We are domestically focused and we're working for all of you. Then I watch how our policy actions, which are trying to achieve price stability, full employment, an inclusive economy that works for everyone, how I watch how the economy responds to our policy actions, and I watch how markets and financial markets respond to our policy actions. So I think less about myself managing markets and more about myself collecting market information to understand our financial conditions tightening, our financial conditions loosening. Because I want to understand if, you know, the way monetary policy works is we raise the federal funds rate and then and we'd lower it and it would do the same thing symmetrically, but right now we're raising the federal funds rate. That affects other market interest rates. Those market interest rates affect borrowing and investment and savings and all those decisions that consumers and businesses make. And then that ultimately makes investing and purchasing less more costly. So you pull back on that and that slows the economy, bringing demand back in line with supply and inflation comes down. That's what my work is. So when I look at the markets, I'm asking several questions. Are they understanding the reaction function that the Federal Reserve has, that the FOMC has? Are they understanding, or do they see the data the way I'm seeing it? And if not, let me learn from what they're seeing and see if it builds my understanding. And then if the markets, in the case recently, bond yields have tightened, meaning financial conditions have tightened, that's an indicator of financial conditions broadly have tightened, it's more expensive to get a loan, then, well, if that's tight, Maybe the Fed doesn't need to do as much. That's why I said, depending on whether it unravels or whether the momentum in the economy changes, that could be equivalent to another rate hike. Well, that's data. 
So I use the financial markets as data and as opposed to managing them, I'm trying to communicate to them just like I am to all of you so that they clearly understand what we're trying to achieve. And I'm trying to see how they see things to get the intelligence that they have to ensure that I'm using all kinds of data wherever they come from to make the best decisions. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, no, totally. I don't know if it's busting any myths, <laughs> um, but yeah. that's how we do our work. I mean, I think it's good to know, like, data is always front and focus for the Fed, of course. Um, and I think, like, one interesting part about the data that you all collect is, is, of course, with the labor market, right? And the labor market is really tough to measure. Like, it's pretty confusing. You know, we're seeing strength in prime age employment, the labor force participation rate, and the quits and hiring rates have mostly stabilized back to 2019 levels, which is all good for the long-term strength of the labor market. Uh, and one could say that the labor market is being resilient, but it's also normalizing right, um, with wage growth coming back in, but also being supported by productivity gains. In a recent interview, you said there was no wage price spiral, which is uh, potentially good to hear. And it seems like the risk that the Fed faces every month move more towards um, potentially causing unemployment versus managing inflation, right? Um, so is there an example of like these metrics that you're looking at? Or like, how do you think about balancing those two things, you know, fighting this big fight that you have with inflation, and then also making sure the labor market remains resilient. Sure. So that, that, that let me just tell you how I think about the, the two mandates we have, price stability, full employment. And they're often seen as trade-offs, right? That if you want one to be better, you have to give up the other one. But that's not always true. And in fact, I would argue in the last nine months, it really hasn't been true, right? Because inflation has been able to come down and the labor markets continue to expand. Now, what we were worried, what I was worried about for most of the last year and a half was inflation was very far off our mark and we needed to get traction in bringing it down. As we've been able to get the policy rate up 525 basis points and we've got inflation to start on a downward trajectory, then the risks to the economy are becoming more balanced, the risks of under versus over tightening. Mm -hmm. But I'm still completely resolute that we've got to get inflation down in order for us to have a fully balanced economy. So then I get asked this question all the time, but what about jobs? And so I give two answers. And let me start with the first one uh, because it's really relevant for right now. The job market is continuing to expand. We need to add about 100,000 jobs a month, and we're adding far above 100,000 jobs a month. 100,000 jobs per month would just keep everything steady, right? Because it would, it would absorb all the jobs, the new entrants to the labor force and returning people to the labor force need. We're adding far more than that, which means the labor market's very strong. So that's good news. But let me say the other bigger thing. Ultimately, you know, I grew up in... Um, the 70s and early 80s, I came of age kind of in the 80s and get my first job. And those were the periods where we had high inflation and then we went into a terrible recession. And what I learned in, from those experiences is that people need two things. They need price stability and a job. So we don't want to have people say, well, I'm going to make sure you have a job, but inflation's running away because what that does is it erodes real wages and people feel like they're on a treadmill. The, you know, you're making money, more and more money each month, and you're losing purchasing power. You're losing your place in the economy on a weekly basis. So you don't want that. But of course, we don't want to raise rates so quickly or so much that we tip the economy into recession. And now people have less inflation, but no job. So this is the whole balancing act we've been doing for the entire time. How much can the economy take in terms of rate increases so we can get the policy rate to a level that's reasonable to bring inflation down, and how can we do that without tipping the labor market over? I would say now the risks of, of how we balance those things are roughly balanced, over tightening versus under tightening, but we still have a high inflation and the labor market's still strong. So my concerns that we're going to tip the, the labor market over are not as high as I'm resolute that we need to bring inflation down. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I want people to earn a living and not feel like they are losing uh, that, you know, losing position every month. That is just not, that's demoralizing, right? You make more and more money and you fall further and further behind. That's not the economy that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. And uh, a recent Nobel, Nobel Prize winner did a lot of work on the labor market, Claudia Golden, um, 
tr she, you know, she did the, all this descriptive work, so going back through archives, compiling and correcting historical data, and it changed our understanding of women in labor markets in really fascinating ways. But there was this quote that the Nobel Prize uh, Twitter account tweeted: uh, "Choices that affect entire careers are based on expectations that may later prove to be false." And so, what do you think that we could change about the labor market? So this is beyond just like you know metrics and stuff to make it more inclusive to hedge against some of these expectations that people could have going into the labor market. So, you know, Claudia Golden is just, if, if you're an economist, she's just somebody you always have said, wow, that's work that's amazing because it's not just about the kinds of methods she used, you know, going into archives, studying things. It's the topics she was willing to take on that were not considered like the mainstream topics you should take on. And what they've done, it's transformed how we think about the labor market. It's transformed how we think about education and, and how we look at history and, and think about these things. And one of the lessons from that is just what you say, that you know, if we expect people to be a certain thing, and then they make choices based on those expectations, and then we later prove them to be wrong, what's the big lesson there in my judgment? We've left so much talent on the table. So your question is what we can change in the labor market. Let me start earlier. What, we, what can we change in how people expect themselves to be when they grow up? If someone comes to you, I mean, you're young, and so you're going to say, many of you are young, and you're going to say, uh, I can't really affect people. You can affect people at any point in time because they may see their world like this. And what you're saying is, oh, it could be like this. I mean, you can go from being an options trader to interviewing a <laughs> bank president and yes. having your own um, following. And those are things that are about transforming people. So I think that's what the labor market has to learn, that how you start out doesn't need to be how you end. You can have a dynamic career. You can reinvent yourself countless times. You can reinvent yourself at the same, in the same occupation or job or even place, but you can do different things. And I think the labor market sort of looks for lots of experience. And what I see happening, which is great, it's one of the benefits of a tight labor market, people are looking at skills. And skills that you might gain in one profession, you can, you can move those skills to another profession. And I think that, personally, I've studied the labor market a long time, not only does that release the talent that's always been there, but it actually probably is the new frontier. Because if you take somebody from one profession and you say, oh, reinvent yourself and come over to this other profession, but bring all the skills you learned in that job, that is like the newest way to create innovation and ideas. And, and I have reinvented myself so many times in my career, um, even at the same, in the same profession, just by saying, I'm interested in that. I'm going to go just work with people who are interested in that. I've worked with psychologists and you know, demographers and social, other social scientists, sociologists. I've worked with um, a physicist at one point, And all of that made my mind expand. So I think the labor market should be this sea of talent where everybody gets this, gets up and says, I can do that, and we see what happens. Yeah. But I think, you know, tight labor markets are good for this. People um, complain about tight labor markets, not workers so much. But one of the things that um, constraints do tight labor markets is it creates innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think this opportunity is to take what Claudia Golden taught us and realize uh, we have lots of opportunity here in the U.S. Yeah. and other places, but here in the U.S., and we should take a hard look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I, you know, there's some aspects of the economy that aren't, that don't have as much opportunity, right? So it feels like the beginner mode of life is gone. So the Mitsubishi Mirage, which is, like, I think the last car that was selling for under 20K, they're discontinuing it. And so now I don't think there's any cars for selling that are selling less than 20K. And so what would you say to this idea that it feels like there isn't accessibility beginning in life? Like, it's really hard to get a house. You know, cars are very, very expensive. Like, what would you say to young people who are grappling with, you know, dealing with that? So, you know, one thing that, so I, so, you know, I said, I mentioned, so I, it's worth mentioning again. So the, every generation is going to have some challenge that seems different than the generation right before. That's just the way it goes, right? That this generation comes in and you, you all, many of you, I mean, there's a wide range of generations here, but you could face the financial crisis. You could have seen your parents in the financial crisis. Then we have a pandemic. Now we have high inflation. When I came out of school and I started entering, you know, college and go to the labor market, it was high inflation and a very poor job market. And we were in a major recession. So, you know, what I learned from that is to take the moment in and get through it, but not lose hope for the next time. So I said, well, what do I want to be? What do I, how do I want to be in the world? What do I want to do? I, so I had 
as many of us do. You buy your first car as used because you can't afford the new one and you just work your way up. And if a new car is what you want, you eventually get one, but you don't have to have it today. Uh, the same thing with a house. You might say, well, I can't buy a house right now, Mary, and but I want one. Well, then start thinking about how to save and work on that so that when you when interest rates come down and you're ready, you can get in there and get it. But it doesn't mean your life is stalled out, right? It just means you're working on that. And, and I think ultimately, what I say is this economy right now is imbalanced. That's why we have high inflation. We are working hard at the Fed to make sure it comes back into balance. When things are more in balance, when inflation's 2% and the economy is growing in a regular way, all the decisions you're, faced, you're forced to make seem more manageable. And right now, then we have all those pressures. You're trying to keep up, inflation's coming up, it's hard to buy a house, it's hard to buy a car, et cetera. Everything seems just like it'll always last, and it won't always last. That's the benefit of living a long time. You, you've seen everything once or twice before, and you realize it comes and it goes, and the people who prepare themselves while it's there to g grab it when we're out of it are the people who are in the best position. So ready yourselves for when interest rates go down, for when the economy comes back into balance. Get yourselves ready to go, and then go forward. It's always a, it's a good opportunity right when we emerge from a transition. And we're emerging from the transition. That's the other piece of good news. Inflation is coming down. Interest rate raising is working. The economy is coming back into balance after the pandemic. And ultimately, supply and demand will equalize and it will get easier. Yeah. And I want to zoom out to your like, super big picture. Um, there is a lot of geopolitical unrest, which is a super reductive summary of what's going on. But how does the Federal Reserve incorporate that into their worldview in, in the policy actions? So, you know, if you're, when you think about things like wars and the outbreak of war, well, the first thing that happens, and I think this is true for all of us, is we just recognize the human toll. And that's got to be first and foremost to take on the human toll of, of things tragic like wars. What we then, of course, do, because our role is about the domestic economy and price stability and and economic growth and full employment is we think about what is this doing to our growth and if not to our growth to uncertainty and so right now geopolitical uncertainty is adding to already some domestic uncertainty and some uncertainty about where the futures where what does it hold and how fast will it come and that is just something that makes people a little less they're a little more cautious when uncertainty rises businesses are a little more cautious about hiring uh, building out output, consumers become a little more cautious about spending because they want to be ready for whatever it is. But that's how I factor it in. And then, of course, if it changes oil prices or it changes demand for exports or something, we would monitor that. It's just the data that comes in. So it's not, we, it's not that we rotate everything to that, but we absolutely pay attention to it. But it's, it's part of a large das dashboard of data that we're always following. And you know, I, t I gave a talk yes, uh, last week, a speech in New York, and I, I used two phrases, we need, or two words. We need to be, um, use vigilance and agility. Mm -hmm. So we need to be vigilant to keep watching the data, constantly looking at the dashboard of indicators out in our communities, talking to people, talking to people like yourself, interviewing uh, with you, thinking about these things. And then we need to be agile enough to adjust policy so that when conditions change, we can change. Because if we get stuck and we're only doing one thing and we're not vigilant at watching the data and agile and adjusting how we see the world, well then we can end up with policy mistakes. And so that's why you hear us say we're data dependent. If I unpack data dependence, it's really vigilance and agility. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that we're bringing to the table when we deliberate and debate what to do next. Always with the mind, again, just to reinforce this, always with the mind that we're serving all of you. And our goals are given and they're simple. Mm -hmm. Price stability, full employment. <laughs> There'll be a quiz later. <laughs> yeah, um, so this will be my final question. Then we'll go to Q&A from the audience as well as online. Uh, so at your 2019 Syracuse commencement address, you mentioned that your favorite people in the policy making space are those that disagree with you or that you disagree with. I'm not going to ask you who you disagree with, uh, but what are some things that you have disagreed with recently that you've come to change your mind on? That's a terrific question. And wow, I love it when people read stuff back to me that I, <laughs> uh, that I didn't expect. Okay. But seriously, you know, you said something, uh, you won't ask me who I disagree with. Really, really, the best part of your life can be this, the best part of policy making, the best part of having people surround you. It won't be you always disagree with this person. 
It will be different people take up a different stance and argue it. That's when it really is working, right? It's not that you just disagree with this person because you have a different value system or whatever. It's that different people take up, they just see the world differently and then they think about it. So here's an example. I was a great champion of labor force participation could absolutely go up during after the financial crisis when people said, no, it's going to be stuck where it was right after the financial crisis. And I was one of the people pushing it. Interestingly, after the pandemic, I did get worried that we were just going to see it not come back. And that, you know, because of the problems with child care, because of the problems with commuting distances and gas prices and things, we would just see that stalling out. And I have a, a couple of younger team members working on this topic and they they revitalized my old some of my old work and reminded me and said, no, I think if you do it this way, you can see something positive. And I was like, I don't think so. Sure enough, they're right. And I changed my mind. But what I, uh, they disagreed with me, not by just um, saying, well, I don't agree. They brought me evidence and they said, okay, here's what would need to happen if we're gonna see this rise. And so then I said, well, let, what are we gonna watch? Well, we're gonna watch what happens to female labor force participation. We're gonna find out what happens to younger people's labor force participation. We're gonna find out what happens when the dust settles and the pandemic settles down and people go back to work. And they led me, uh, they, they took me through all their information and that disagreement did two things. One, it proved to be right, but that's actually not the most important thing. The most important thing is it made me less sure of what I was, what my prior was. And that made me say, and if you go back to my public commentary, you'll notice this, that we actually don't know what's going to happen with participation. Because I came in thinking, oh, I'm not as optimistic, but I, there evidence and their risk assessment cautioned me from being declarative. And I think that's what's really great about policy. Yes, let's be declarative about things we know, but let's also be very humble about when we don't know and just communicate effectively that we're watching it, but we don't yet know. And the data will guide us. And that's what makes good policy, letting the data guide us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that was the interview with Mary Daly, president and CEO of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. I wanted to talk a lot about the labor market and talk about, you know, the Fed's tools and how they sort of trickle down in the economy. Um, a lot of people will point to the idea of the Federal Reserve inadvertently causing inequality is sort of that idea of unintended consequences. Talk about the difference between hard data and soft data and how important it is that the Fed manages emotions. Like, are they doing more PSYOP work than monetary policy work? Of course, it's a mix of both. And perfect becoming enemy of the good. And there's been a lot of Fed speakers out this week. President Barkin went out and he was like, there's been a secular demand in the in the demand for housing, a secular change in the demand for housing. People want a house. And I, I don't know, like, I feel like I'm really focusing on housing, but it feels like the economy is entering a new normal. And as President Daly spoke about in our interview, it always feels like a new normal. But <laughs> when you're living in the new normal, it can feel a little bit fuzzy, a little bit strange, a little bit uncertain. Um, and yeah, so the whole goal is just to talk about policy, to get a better grip of what the Federal Reserve is trying to accomplish, and then to, you know, be like, okay, well, I exist in this economy within the bounds of the Federal Reserve. And, and so it seems like the Federal Reserve is going to hold rates steady. We'll see at the November meeting what they end up doing, but it seems like they're kind of taking a pause, saying, okay, we're going to take a look around before we rev that engine up again if we, if we choose to do so. They're seeing inflation slow down, seeing the labor market respond relatively okay to what they've been doing. Uh, so we, we could be seeing a more cautious Fed um, proceeding carefully, etc. Unfortunately, with a lot of this, it's a wait and see sort of game. So we'll just have to wait and see. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. I hope that you enjoyed the interview. And yeah, I'll look forward to your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to share with a friend, uh, hit subscribe like it all helps but yeah talk to y'all soon